Okay, um, we'll make a start. So it's half past eleven. We have half an hour to be absolutely wowed by Ventura, who's uh, the session hosted by Sergey, and um, who's going to talk to us about flexible learning needs and flexible techs. Uh, flexible tech um, accessibility is a real, a real big thing. Um, we heard about in the student speech and um, the student panel discussion. So I certainly am looking forward to it. Um, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, and uh, great to be here uh, once again. I remember last year in the University of Manchester, this time a slightly more suburban, maybe even rural campus uh, at Warwick, so wonderful to be here. Uh, and thanks all for, for joining today. Um, I'm here with Kaltura, and joining me uh, is John Cooperthwaite there, uh, who promised to ask me some very difficult questions if uh, no one has any. Um, but uh, we're both part of the education team at Kaltura. Uh, so my name is Sergey. John's over there. Preemptively, if anyone wants to speak with us who hasn't already, we're just right outside there, stand 12. Um, so if you've got a question that maybe you think is not directly relevant to, to everybody in the room, feel free to, of course, save that and just find us afterwards. Or if you haven't got our sticker yet, you won't be able to win bingo uh, without that. So uh that's another good reason so subject today is flexible learning and flexible technology uh really being the key facilitator of a truly flexible learning environment so just to set the scene a little bit you know of course our perspective is that of a, of a technology provider and we do work with over 600 education institutions around the world so that's very much the the angle that we're coming at it from uh, but what we're seeing, of course, is the world is more flexible now than ever before. Um, I certainly work far more flexibly now than I ever did, uh, you know, four or five uh, years ago. Um, and of course, higher education is striving to keep up. And I think that's a very good thing. Uh, we are seeing more and more terms uh, such as blended learning, hybrid learning, high flex learning, digital, online, lifelong, all, all have different uh, undertones, different definitions, and I know some of them can be quite controversial terms and people uh, do debate what they actually mean or what they should mean. But certainly the, the list goes on and there's more and more of this terminology that's that's been cropping up uh, in, in digital learning uh, or in, in our world of technology enhanced learning. And what we're seeing is universities do want to offer students genuine flexibility, but a lot of the time there are legacy systems that do prevent that progress. Um, and the result is a fragmented digital ecosystem and a very rigid learning environment for students. Uh, specifically what, it, what that means in practice is often technologies that might not talk to each other or data that is lost or you have overlapping data so it's difficult to make sense of it. Uh, so really the, the goal is to create something that's not only just more flexible as an experience for, for students, but also something that for uh, educators or anyone supporting that education is able to make sense, consolidate data, and actually use that to improve the experience again. So what trends are, am I seeing out there? And this is both uh, in the UK and also you know, continental Europe and, and more broadly around the world. Um, I'm seeing more and more reviews of, of digital learning systems. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, during COVID, of course, many of us were forced into certain technologies, certain ways of learning that we wouldn't have otherwise done. And now that that's hopefully behind us for maybe another 100 years uh, or so, there's a chance now to step back and think again, well, what is the best way of learning? What is the best digital learning environment that we, as you know, any given university, can build? Um, and this is across the board. So I'm seeing some of the biggest universities undertake these reviews. Uh, and that is so, so difficult. And it's, it's, it's a huge challenge to get the community on board, right, to survey students, especially if you're, for example, University of Manchester, they've got a, a, an amazing new flexible learning program with people dedicated to that new roles being created. Of course, it does help when, when you can secure the budget and the resourcing for that. But it's hard even, even then to survey the community, the students, the staff, the support teams that facilitate all of that. 
um, and based on that, actually make some sort of sense of, of that survey and, and be able to create some recommendations and, and action that into, into a better way. And as I mentioned, University of Manchester, you know, new flexible learning strategies being created um, and, and really a strong desire to streamline and consolidate uh, both from students um, and, and we'll go into why in just a second. Uh, digital learning or, or technology enhanced learning teams, uh, faculty and IT departments as well. I know it's not it's not often as easy as that, but I am sensing from different different departments of different universities, and certainly as a trend, we can say that there's more and more interest in consolidating and streamlining now that we are out of COVID, hopefully uh, for a very very long time, and we can really use the opportunity to rebuild a bit more intentionally going forward. So I said, you know, why, why, do, why do students, why do staff, why do IT teams want to consolidate? What's in it for them, essentially? Um, for, you know, first and foremost, I'd say that, this, that the fragmented synchronous and asynchronous learning uh, experiences, that they, they can sometimes lead into um, a, a pretty fragmented experience as a whole, right? Where you, you're doing one thing for maybe a live class, maybe it's a fully in-person class or it's a fully uh, online class or something in the middle, uh, and any asynchronous learning experiences, you know, how does that all tie together? Are they using the same platforms? Are they using different platforms? Uh, is it all tied in nicely uh, with the VLE or, or do you have to go externally at all times? So for students, what do they care about? Well, as much as we, we're hearing from them and we try and keep as close to them as possible, they want a more seamless learning experience. So they just want to be able to uh, have a very intuitive uh, journey, really. When, whenever they've got any online learning or digital learning, they want to minimize training materials or minimize the need to go to uh, technology support teams uh, to actually help them in their, in their learning. It needs to be really, really intuitive. For faculty, and of course connected to that are digital learning or technology enhanced learning teams, uh, we want really, really high adoption as much as possible. Because if technology is adopted, then of course uh, it, is, it is used, it stays, it's much easier to keep it in the system, uh, much easier to renew it going forward. Um, and IT, of course, uh, often care about, amongst other things, but they care about lower cost and managing fewer suppliers, managing fewer, paying fewer licenses, doing fewer due diligence processes. Of course, they, it's a big, big, big deal for them. If they can streamline and consolidate that, uh, and if, if we can sell it to them in that way, uh, then they'll be very happy. And it certainly does make a project much, much more likely to happen and then actually succeed. Oh, a mention of inclusivity and accessibility um, is very, very important in the context of flexible learning, because ultimately, ultimately what is flexible learning if it's not uh, a personalized way of learning, right? Where we give different types of learners the opportunity to learn their way and the way that works best for them. Now, of course, there are those who have medically diagnosed conditions that require them legally. I mean, there's just no other way to learn uh, in their own way. But actually, there's great research that says that that's actually a minority of, of the preferences, right, for, for different learning ways. There are plenty of students. Some research says that it's almost half of all students prefer some other way of learning than the traditional standard way, whether that's to do with how uh, videos or, or, or online content is captioned in terms of you know, what do those captions actually look like and of how do they correspond to, to the video itself, different formats, different color schemes, different uh, languages, different, um, you know, there's other things in there as well. So, you know, as I mentioned, automatic captions, how can we as a technology provider give our universities the most accurate automatic captions? That is, it's difficult. Uh, especially when it comes to 
something very technical. Are we talking about maybe a medical course? Are we talking about a linguistics course, which has a lot of terminology that the AI captioning service uh, would uh, would find difficult to, to transliterate properly. Um, so we need to constantly be on the lookout for the best, most accurate providers out there so we can integrate them into our system and give universities the best uh, automatic system there. Human captions cost a lot, but sometimes they are necessary. And I know universities uh, do sometimes want to invest in that, at least where it's most needed. Uh, and for example, like I mentioned, medicine, um, transcriptions, translations, audio descriptions, uh, and also automatic chaptering. Um, I know certainly if I get a, an hour long video, how likely am I to watch it straight through beginning to end? Well, if I'm really, really keen, obviously I, I might be, uh, I might do it. But if, if I'm on the fence or maybe the material, we don't know how engaging it is, what could help me? Of course, I can, I can speed up the video. If I could do it on 1.5x or even 2x speed, uh, obviously students love that feature. Um, if it's chaptered, that really, really helps. Chaptering, if it's manual, takes time. Um, but if it's automatic and if it's smart, then it, it can be a very, very good way to break down a very long video into dig digestible chunks. Something else that we are working on and we want to do more of in the future is um, a kind of boiling down long videos into more digestible chunks. Basically thinking of all sorts of different ways to make large data sets of information more digestible, easily accessible, uh, right there at your fingertips, you know, obviously in, in a familiar environment of, of a VLE. Can we do more? Well, yes, and, and this is a, a huge part of, of, of our organization. If we, if we talk about Kaltura for a little bit, um, we think that a university's video platform shouldn't just be for current students. Um, it should also be for the entire student journey. And where does the student journey start often before a student's actually enrolled? You know, the, uh, someone's first interaction with the university is probably before they go there, right? When they discover it online, maybe someone recommends it to them. Their school says maybe you should, you've got a chance of getting in somewhere like this. Uh, or there's this. There's always a way that someone can discover university before they're actually enrolled. So then the question is, is back on us. Well, can we support that journey? Can we support a, a closer engagement, better reach, um, a better conversion for student recruitment teams from applicants to students? Uh, and so the use case outside of the VLE becomes really important. Then a student is an enrolled student. It, you know, they're part of the system. They're authenticated. Uh, you know, it's all in the VLE. Great. When they leave, what happens? Do they just stop being a member of the community unless they, you know, maybe live locally or sometimes they come back to work for the university, which is always a nice thing. But alumni are often a university's biggest community. And it's, it's often an, an untapped community, right, in terms of potential for helping out current students with their first job or actually supporting the university in, you know, let's call it as it is, right, financially. Often, you know, university for, for someone can be the, the fun time that they remember some time ago where they made their best friends, where it was a bit more carefree. Can they, if they have the means, give back and maybe contribute to new facilities or contribute to a new scholarship or contribute some other way, maybe even if it's very small, um, to make that institution that they hold so dearly uh, even more successful and more sustainable for the future. So then I always enjoy those conversations with alumni and development teams when we're talking about ways to engage university communities that maybe aren't talked about enough uh, in, in this way. And it is challenging, but I will say that it is possible to have one video platform that supports synchronous and asynchronous learning for current students, for lifelong students once they uh, graduate and they're part of the alumni, big alumni world. Uh, and throughout their career, they can come back and 
and reskill or upskill uh, themselves as they need. Very briefly about us um, as a company, just to give again some context as to why we have this perspective. We you know how do we actually know what we're talking about in this respect? Well, we do um, a lot of work with with higher education. We work with other industries as well, and this this is a you know it's something that really helps us. For example, we work with uh, in the media space. We work with enterprise, and there are certain high demands in those industries that force us to improve our product that force us to have a really you know, resilient video player or just constantly modernize our in interface and experience. So actually we're, we're happy to be uh, kind of kept honest by those other industries. Uh, but education still remains our biggest single industry that, that we're in. We've got about 600, uh, probably more than 600 education institutions that are part of our community. And we, we keep a close, connection with them, of course, as they use us and we, we survey them, we, we want to hear how we can improve and what we can build that is more useful. Um, and, you know, of course, when it comes to uh, some, some notable uh, institutions around the world, and we could put all sorts of logos on there, but uh, some of the notable ones in, in the UK include University of, of Sheffield and Edinburgh and Glasgow and Cambridge and uh, KCL and and there's always more that are exploring uh, coming on board for, for sometimes common reasons, sometimes uh, very specific ones. So I'll leave it just before we uh, maybe give some time for questions uh, with this slide, which I think really illustrates quite well how we can be useful to your institution. So if you're thinking of, of taking a photo of one slide that's about Kaltura, make it this slide because it's the red part is probably what you'd expect. And that's video for teaching and learning. And as I mentioned earlier, it's synchronous, virtual classrooms, et cetera. It's asynchronous, lecture capture, video content management, et cetera. But also look at all those other use cases where, where we are involved in it and could be helpful. And I realize that might not be your department. It could be someone else at the university that we'd need to be working with. But if you sense that there's an interest there, um, we could be useful to them. So that includes, as I mentioned, campus communications, events, marketing and student recruitment, uh, alumni relations, uh, teacher training, uh, and even more than that. So if, if this is of any interest, again, if you've got questions, if you think it's useful for everyone, please chime in and also, um, Curious, if, even if you haven't got a question, if it's just a comment or you disagree with something or, or you, anything like that, then feel free to, to chip in. But otherwise, we'll be just there on Stand 12. John and I will be holding, holding down the fort today and tomorrow. So thank you very much for, for listening and, yeah, curious to hear your feedback. Yeah, the back. So no, I'm just thinking, you talked about fragmented ecosystem and flexibility. So I was kind of wondering, well, basically, I think it's fair to say in higher education, if you kind of sweep together multiple systems behind a single sign on, and this kind of thing's not always there. But if I was like a university administrator, I'd say, well, what are the risks of putting our eggs in one basket? You know, I'd be worried about silos, big data, I'd be worried about vendor determined educational futures. Um, so I was wondering, maybe, you know, maybe if they did devil's advocate for the cause and say, rather than eggs in one box, doesn't flexibility come from the diversity of tools, which are used appropriately, which you know got decent scaffolding, you know, which basically are part of an education design, which is coherent rather than just one box for everything. No, I think it's a very fair point. I'm I'm sure many of us would agree that you shouldn't consolidate too much and you shouldn't force yourself, um, you, you shouldn't kind of depend too much on one uh platform either. I think that I can't remember who told me this, but I think it was actually. Um, the University of Manchester, Ian Hutt, uh, who leads the digital learning team there, said that they have about 1,300 digital tools, 1,300. And it, it's just such an overwhelming number that I think that's just too much. And I don't think they're an outlier in, they might be because they're so huge in that exact number, but I don't think they're an outlier in how many tools there are at, uh, at the university, how many license fees are being paid, how many tools are kind of sitting on the shelf 
whether for real or metaphorically. So I'd say I completely agree that you shouldn't put too many eggs in one basket, but where you can consolidate and cre create what's a visibly better journey for the learner, I think it should at least be explored. And you might at the end say, actually, no, yeah, we've seen that, but we still want to have this platform for A, another platform for B, uh, a third platform for C. And if as long as that's an intentional decision based on a conscious review, I don't think anyone can argue too much with that. Graham. Thanks, Sergei. I'd like to illustrate from an institutional perspective, specifically around creating a video. So in 2017, we noticed we had a problem that we didn't really have a suitable um, video hosting platform that was really fit for any of our key vertical requirements on our institution. And in fact, what had happened was because we had, we ended up with a number of variously unsuitable platforms. We had people, and we had a lecture, we had a lecture recording, which was great for the lecture recording application. We had um, an old media hosting system, which really wasn't up to it. It was a very weird kind of uh, user management rights. Um, people, some people were sticking stuff in YouTube. We had outward facing content in our GG. And what we basically ended up with was a complete melee of misunderstanding. There was no single way to, to find and locate uh, in, uh, video information. It was very difficult to create. So, Whilst I think you're absolutely right in certain things, you need to understand that there are, I think, you know, that there are certain compartmentalizations that are worth making. So if you really want to take the video seriously, it's, it's, it's a very specific requirement to have that to actually go. Definitely not something I recommend. So we actually consolidated all our video applications and actually as just so happened we went with that choice. So I think I understand what you're saying, you want every single application, but trying to control manage because that was my job to manage video across five platforms, none of which are any good, really, or none of which or you know that they all have issues is really it's not a it's not a good place to put Sure. So I know what you mean. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So anything that's external. Um, so think, is this a prospective student, you know, an applicant? Is this an alumnus or an alumna? Um, the way that the licensing would work there is, is by registrant annually. And it's not a kind of FT basis where it's, you know, we can say this is a learner that engages basically almost every day with technology. It's often through virtual events or hybrid events or some, some kind of digital experience that someone will have. Um, and if it's external, then the licensing works by registrant, essentially. And they would often register just as an external participant to that. They don't need to be authenticated via SSO or anything like that, or go through the VLE. Uh, they, have to pay they wouldn't have to pay. Oh. They wouldn't have to pay. I mean, someone has to pay at the end, uh, obviously. And if an alumni department thinks it's worthwhile having a, a platform to facilitate that digital engagement, then they often, uh, you know, are happy to pay for it. Um, and if they have many people joining at the end, then actually the cost per registrant is very low. Very good. Anything else before we wrap up? Just, I was intrigued you were talking about um, lexicons, um, language, and technical terms, and how they're reflected in captioning. I mean, that's one of the mass, you know, big, biggest challenges that the sector is facing. Yeah. The scheduled um, lecture recordings, and it's a huge workload to start to, to correct. So you talked about your suppliers, and um, I mean, how are you solving that problem? And you know, beyond medicine, this this affects the whole science science disciplines in particular but also it addresses um our international faculty different accents and yeah sensitive to the software to actually produce an accurate caption so how are you tackling that problem to come we have to realize what we're good at and focus on that and we have to realize when something is is not our game to play 
and how can we bring them to our system by integrating with them? And so we, we, we've long realized, and I don't think any video platform brings it completely upon themselves, maybe certain, maybe Zoom or some of the, the teams or huge ones, right, backed by Microsoft or whatever, they can maybe develop their own large language models and, you know, AI captioning services. But for us, we just have to stay as close as we can to the most innovative specialists in that field. And some of the common names you guys might know are Verbit, you know, Amberscript. They could be the ones for today, but they might not be the ones for tomorrow. And if we sense that there is a better way, if there is a technology that's emerging that is much more accurate, much more sensitive to different accents and dialects, then we have to make sure that we can integrate that into our system, you know, get the APIs talking to each other. The end user never has to worry about that because it's just a technology tech in integration. Um, and so for us, it's really just being, you know, ahead of the game as much as possible. And John, if you've got something to contribute yeah, as well. Just, just to add to that, so we have these sort of reach services. So it's partnership agreements with probably about eight or 10 different companies who offer different types of, of uh, captioning and chattering and dubbing and translation services. Uh, one other thing to mention as well is the, the ability to add key terms into a dictionary. You can add such about 8,000 terms or words that can be added to this dictionary within the institution system. And those are words that the um, uh, e providers can look up. And if they're frequently misunderstood terms, uh, they will then be corrected through this dictionary that we provide. So we are trying to address those issues of misunderstood words, key technical terms. Um, and kind of have a forcing mechanism within the system where you can apply those dictionaries. Yeah, it's often about not making the same mistake twice, or at least not, not three times or four times. Uh, so being able to learn from when the system gets it wrong, if we've got time to, to review that, to, to, to make that improvement, and then the system actually should learn and not make that same mistake again. But yeah, there's no perfection in that. But we're always, I think we're getting there. We're getting a bit closer. How are we doing for time? I think we're almost there. Perfect. Well, thanks again, everyone. I, I love talking on this subject and I'm sure many of you do as well. So say hello to us at Stand 12 if you haven't got your stick already, but uh, great to see you and enjoy the rest of the conference.